Well, this is fun for me. I like coming back to UVU. I, uh, I anticipate, I've, I've got some children that have come here and they've had a great time. And uh, anyway, I've, I've had some interaction with some of the presidents of UVU. I remember on one occasion, Brother, uh, uh, President Romsberg told me that the demographics of, of this university fall very much on Brigham Young University's demographics. It's about the same number of international students, about the same number of Mormon, non-Mormon, the same number of about the same academic entrance. And I said, there is one difference between UVU students and BYU students. UVU students are a lot better looking. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a true observation. I taught a little, anyway, I mean, I, I think we could measure that. But anyway, I, I do, I, uh, I, I think it's an opportunity to come to speak, and I, and I thought, if, from what perspective should I speak? I've got 21 grandkids. I'm, they're probably, they range from uh, four to 17 right now, but in, in not too many years, I think they'll be here at UVU, and, I'd, and uh, they'll be continuing their education. And what would I tell them? And what would I want them to hear? And uh, I'm kind of at the swan, song of life. I've uh, retired from U.S. Synthetic about three years ago and uh, Chris, my wife and I spent the last two years in Kenya. We've, we've had a project over there for 12 years and maybe that was one of the reasons that I was invited to come speak at the classes because we've, we've had a drive to do some good in the world and try to be a problem solver and uh, that's where we've been the last bit of our life. I'll, I'll tell you something about that. But we're right at the threshold now of a new venture. We're off to do a LDS mission in Montana, Glendive, Montana. I don't know if you can see it on the map, but that's where we're going. And we'll be off in a, about a week for 18 months. But uh, let me take it, let me, let me, I'll start by saying that it may be a little eclectic what, what I'm talking about, and I'm, I'm, I'll try to bring it to general principles of what my recommendations are to my grandkids and you guys, and how I would, how I would, what I would recommend in, in entering into this life and uh, being a full citizen. First, let me give you kind of a, uh, a two, maybe a 60 second history of the, la of the world in the uh, graphically what you're looking at right now is on this on the y-axis you're looking at life expectancy so and each one of these spheres represents a country of the world the size of the sphere is the population the year is 1800 so these, these dark blue, these are the African countries. The orange are Europe, red is Asia. India and uh, Pakistan are in this color. Americas are in the yellows. So what's the state of the world in the 1800s? You know, I, I don't know if, if you appreciate how different the world is today than it was in the 1800s. Look, what's the life expectancy of a United States citizen? 39 years old. In other words, when a child was born in the United States in the 1800s, their life expectancy was average, 39. Their income on a GDP adjusted for inflation, so these are real numbers, was 1913 bucks. What it says, if you look at this little grouping right here, is all the data is that everybody was about the same. The difference between the richest country in the world and the poorest country in the world was about four to one. There wasn't a lot of disparity. Now, if I rolled the timetable back to, the, to uh, zero, to the birth of Christ, that picture wouldn't look very much different. It would shift ever so slightly. So for, for millennium, the world existed in this zone right here. The village life, the poverty, the disease, the life expectancy was just, 
your great great grandfather's life wasn't much different than your life. But what happened? What ha now th this is a fun little graph. This is called gapminder.org. So if I push the play button right now, it's going to take us, it's going to roll us through in about just a few seconds. It's going to roll us through what's happening in time, both on a health index and an economy index. So you see time rolling on right now. You see the, the European countries start to pull out a little bit economically and a little bit on the health. 1900, that century just passed. You saw World War I dip. You'll see another dip in World War II. So now, much of the world, let me back up to 1950. You know one of the phenomena? Well, maybe I'll go even back a little bit further. Because I was born in 1947. I can't quite get it there, but you get the idea. So, here is the United States when I was born. Now life expectancy is 67. In 150 years, it's gone from 39 to 67. Income per capita has risen to 15,000. Now we're going to roll it fast forward or to the year today. Watch what happens. Look at China and India over here. That's kind of an encouraging piece of news, isn't it? What you see is now we've got, we're spread out, but nobody's down here in the, the gloomy 39 years old at life expectancy or income. Africa is about the same. Africa's improved in health Africa being all these dark blue countries right here. They've improved in their health situation and they've improved it slightly. Some countries, there's quite a spread there on the economics. Now the United States per capita income is 41,000 and the life expectancy is 79. Basically, come back to here and see Mexico. That's about where it's, it's a little healthier and a little poorer than when the United States when I was born. <coughs> Basically, I was born a Mexican. My economic, the, econo the average economic status of the United States when I was born is the economic status of Mexicans today. If we go back a generation to where my dad was born, he was born in 22, the United States is, is further down there. If we go back to his father, who was born in uh, about 1995, he was, it says that my dad was probably born in an a equivalent to an African country, and my grandfather also, one of those poor African countries. So we've seen tremendous economic growth in the world. The countries that have been left behind, you know, the, the areas of the world, they're still in this portion of the world. But look what's happened to India and China. Tremendous, tremendous economic growth. I'm sorry, the big, the, yeah, this is, this is India today. Oh yeah, the, these little tiny, uh, oh they're worst? Oh, the light blue, Afghanistan. So that's kind of a, in a way, if, when you see the world spread out like that, you say problems are being solved both economically and they're being solved on health and, and life expectancy. It's a, uh, to me, that's a good news item. One of the, uh, let me pull these sheets out here. One of, the, one of the characteristics, I think, of most people is that we're, we're literate. We read, we know things, but we tend to be very poor on numbers. We're not 
we're literate, but we're not numerate. If I, I'm glad if I say if I'm giving you some counsel now to or as you were my grandkids is that <laughs> think about numbers, think about solving problems in the terms of numbers. Here we saw the gravity of, a, of, of the world's health and economics in numbers in a very nice way of presenting that data. If I asked you just to do a little quiz here, some, some uh, write these, I'll give you five numer, number questions that I think you ought to know or you ought to have a reasonable idea uh, as to the magnitude of these numbers but I doubt that most do know this. What's the percent of the US GDP that's spent on foreign aid? What percent of our GDP do we spend on foreign aid? Just write a percent down, what you think it might be. What's the size of the world's economy? In trillions of dollars, I'll give you a clue, it's in trillions. How many trillion is the world's economy, the gross domestic, the gross world product. What's the U.S.'s economy? Third question, what is the size of the, United, the, size of the U.S. economy? What's the size of our debt? The fourth question. What do you think, the fifth question is, what do you think the rate of growth has been from the 1800s to today to get the United States in this position. What do you think the average economic growth rate has been? Now, just, just for yourself, I'll go through the answers to those questions and, you'll, and we'll see if any, how many were close. Foreign aid, what percent of foreign aid of the U.S. economy is spent on foreign aid? Number? What percent? Two percent? Six? Any other numbers? One? Twenty-four. Half a percent? Pretty close. Point three percent. Point three percent. And most of that goes to, e the majority of that goes to Egypt and Israel, and that's for military spending. So not, not a lot. At the, at the peak of our foreign giving, was the Marshall Plan just after World War II, and we rose to 3%. We were giving 3% of our domestic product to try to build Europe back up again with the Marshall Plan. The commitment at the United Nations right now for the developing countries is that every, and the United States signed on to this, is that every country will commit 0.7%, less than 1%, 0.7% to, to uh, foreign aid in developing countries. What's the size of the world's economy? Five, in trillions. How many? 500 trillion? 110 trillion. It's, it's uh, 70 trillion. The United States is economy is about a $15 trillion economy. We're just about a quarter of the world's economy, the United States. So it's what do you think the size of our debt is? How much? About, it's approaching. I think, it's, I think it might be 16 trillion right now. It's almost e our, our gross domestic product and our national debt is about the same number. This is a surprising number. What do you think the rate of growth for us to, be, to get out of that, that poor situation of the 1800s and to come to where we are today what do you think the rate of economic growth has been? Any idea? The average rate of growth for the last 200 years. Is it per year? Per year. The average rate of growth. Pardon? 10? 30? 30. 1.9%. It's kind of interesting. And it gives, so what it says, 1.9% got us to where we are today. It's been a little, in the last 50 years, it's been more like uh, 2.5 to 3%. In 1950 to today, in 2011, our economy in GDP has 17.5 times. 
our economy is 17 times in real dollars larger. And so this has been a phenomenal time. Right now, we're concerned about the, 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 the economy because we're in the worst recession we've had since the Great Depression. You've heard all that. And what do you think that, what's the, what's the magnitude of our loss? It's 5%. In the worst, in 2008, the economy, we've come back up to almost where we were, but it dropped 5%. But to put this in perspective, think about it. I'm just trying to say that numbers really make a difference. I'm glad that I got a mechanical engineering degree before I got my business degree because it, it makes me want to quantify most of, I like numbers, and it makes me want to quantify and understand it, and I'm recommending it. So the economy dropped 5%, but it, like I said, it grew 1,700% since 1950. That means we're a little bit of a whiner. If we grew 17 times and now we've dropped 1,700% and we've dropped 5%, and we think the world is coming to an end. It's, it's not, I mean, we are so, so prosperous. In, the, in, the, in those early days, when, uh, back when in the 1800s, the richest country and the poorest country, the Delta, was about four to one. Now, the, the difference between Switzerland and Mozambique is 400 to one. That means if a, if a, if a Swiss citizen pulls out a penny and, or 1% or of his income and gave it to a Mozambique citizen, he would four times the income of that Mozambique citizen. Part of the reason that we chose Kenya is because it's just a country, it's a country in Africa where the last bastion of poverty is. I think in 100 years, we will see those dark blue dots rise up in health and rise up in income. I, I, there may be another 100 years. For, for China and India, it's progressing so rapidly that it seems like, and Mexico, those were countries that we used to think of as great poverty places. And there's, we're talking of averages, so there's still a lot of poverty in China, there's still a lot of poverty in India, but it's dramatically changing. Like I said, we got to where we were by a 1.9% growth rate, and now, China has grown for 25 years at, 20, at 10% for 25 years. We've never seen growth like that in the history of the world. 10% growth has never happened. You, you know the rule of 72s? The rule of 72, it's kind of an investment number. If whatever you divide, it, if your rate of return is 36%, you divide it into 72, 36 goes into 72 twice. That means you will double your, you'll double your economy or you'll double your investment in two years. If you divide 2% into 72, it's 36 times. That means if you have a 2% growth rate, every 36 years your economy will, your investment will double. That's the rule of 72. So that means in China that they're doubling every seven years or so so you can see that in one person's lifetime, from the day they were born to the time they became an adult, how many times seven divide into that? Let's say it divides three times. It's a little more than that. That means if the economy were a two, it grew to a four, it grew to an eight, it grew to a 16 in, in a generation. That's phenomenal, phenomenal growth. Anyway, I, I like, I like those numbers. Let me tell you an application. Uh, I mean, one, uh, one place that I would say numbers make a difference and give you a, and because we don't use numbers, we get a warped perspective. There's a little, there's a riot in Israel. The, uh, some kids are throwing rocks at the Israeli soldiers. It makes CNN. We watch it. You see tear gas. You see some rubber bullets. And it's kind of an exciting little news clip that, there's, some, there's a skirmish of, in, in Israel. We think that's the condition of the world. It's 200 kids riding. It's the same thing's happening in Libya right now and, and other places, but we get a very warped perspective because we don't quantify it. On the other hand, that same day, 15,000 people visited Lourdes in, in, 
in uh, the Lord's uh, sight where they, they light their candles and they walk up to this spring where uh, they, they want it, spiritual experiences have happened. We have Jews and Muslims and Christians and all kinds of people that gather every night. This happens. It's something like three million people a year without any orchestration, without anybody directing the traffic. They light their candles, they sing Ave Maria, and they walk up the mountain. So what is more real in the world? Those 15,000 people that, that night were loving, having a spiritual experience, walking up the mountain of all kinds of, all kinds of nationalities, all kinds of religions, or those 200 kids in, in Israel, which is more real? We get on the news, we get the, and a perspective that the world is falling to pieces and that, and that uh, all hell's breaking loose. And yet there's a lot of good going on in the world that's not newsworthy. And so I say it gets, it, 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 we, get a, we get a warped perspective. My, uh, My sense is in, in life is that the, just the simple golden rule that we do unto others as we'd have them do unto us is a pretty good guideline. I think that Steve Covey made his, became famous kind of camouflaging Christian principles, and they're universal principles, they're not just Christian, into business principles and writing it into a book like uh, Seek to Be one of his principles is seek to be, seek to understand before you are understood. In other words, put the other person's interest ahead of yours, help to understand what they're doing. It's a do unto others as you would have them do unto you. My recommendation, well, first was numbers. Pay attention to them. Record a few in your mind. Tell your friends about an interesting number you learned. I'll, I'll give you another kind of just off the wall statistic number. What do you think the average tax rate is in the United States for the average citizen, federal taxes, payroll tax, income tax, in 1980? What do you think that rate of taxation was for the average citizen? 70%? It was 20%. It was 19 point something. So that's, all, that's just federal, but it includes payroll. This is gross before deductions. Before deductions, it was 19%. In 2007, it was 14%. In 2011, it was 12%. Now, that's not the perspective you're getting right now, is it? Like we're all going, you know, the, the world is just, all the money's going to Washington. It's all getting warped. We went from the 1980s at an average citizen Payroll and before deductions, taking 19 percent. The federal government was taking out 19 percent, and now we're taking out 12 percent. It really helps in all conversations. Say, just tell me the numbers. Don't give me your adjectives. Don't give me your verbiage. Just what are the numbers? And it it'll, it it kind of changes your view. Back to the back to the golden rule. I think that I was most influenced. I was by one of my professors, that uh, Warner Woodworth at BYU. He wrote a book on uh, on the responsibility of wealth, and I and I think it, I was sort of wired in. We had a good run at U.S. Synthetic. We were we it was uh, we knew we were gonna we had an anticipation that we were gonna prosper, and so as a family we kind of said, what are we gonna do if we really are rich? And I think probably every every one of you have played that game. If I'm rich. What would I do if I really had all the money I needed? What would I do? And the and kind of the the sense of my family and the, my my wiring and and probably yours too is that it's that wealth is a temporal asset, but an eternal liability. That it comes that it's the wealth is really a, a stewardship, a responsibility that you got to do something with it. And so before we got it, we imagined what we wanted to do. We imagined that we wanted to try to do some good, try to good, do some good where the most good, where the need was the greatest. That's probably one of the reasons that we took off for 
Africa because they are so dang poor over there. And a little bit goes a long ways. The evolution of going in and starting out is I think you first start thinking that, well, I've got it in my pocket. Let me just hand it to them. The, the, what I think my evolution of learning in, in trying to be a do-gooder is that the least expensive, the most efficient way to help someone out of poverty is to give them a job, give them a good paying job. It's a, uh, it's again, it's a number thing. Someone asked me, I, I was at a, it's the first time I'd ever heard it asked, it was a mechanical engineer, it was a development conference down in San Francisco, all the philanthropists were there and they were, and he, and he asked the question of the group, he said, how much does it cost to lift someone out of poverty? Which is a good question. If you were gonna set up a program, how many people could you expect had lifted out of poverty? Now poverty is relative. But one way that they define it is it's a dollar a day. That's extreme poverty. That's life-threatening poverty. Two dollars a day is relative poverty. Ten dollar a day, you're doing pretty good in the world. And, the, and about two-thirds of the world, the middle third of the world, does about ten dollars a day per capita. So what would it take, how much would it cost to move someone from a dollar a day to two dollars a day? Some say that in the microcredit world, that is the loaning of money, and that's one of the things that we've done in Africa. We set up a microcredit bank. We've got about, we've got a lot of ladies now, maybe 25,000 or 27,000 ladies, borrowing and saving money that we've invested in the bank so that they can grow their businesses. And they're saving money at the bank too. And so what, what, has been the, what would be the cost on that? And that, this is a pretty conventional tool for helping the poor. It's been around for about 30 years and there are a lot of people doing it and it's, uh, uh, it's a pretty effective tool. The question is, how much did it cost? How much money had to be invested? How many people got lifted out of poverty? And one number that's floating out there is $1,000. But let me give you another example of poverty alleviation that's dramatic. And it's the, big, the most dramatic thing that's happened in the world in poverty alleviation has happened in China. There in the last 25 years, 250 million people have risen out of that extreme poverty to relative poverty. They've gone from the starving, depending on their crops, out on the farm to moving to the factory and getting subsistent wages, but at least they're getting fed. And they've, they've taken one step up the ladder, 250 million people. How much did it cost to move that to, per person, to move those 250 million people up one rung on the ladder? The answer is nothing. It was, it was basically McDonald's, General Electric, General Motors, that saw China as a great opportunity to invest. They poured their money into to businesses and manufacturing because of the low labor rate in China, and people, with, it was an unexpected result. People, poverty was alleviated. And, the, and the, in, the, in the world, there's, uh, maybe 10 billion out in microcredit right now. It's a, big, it's a big industry. But maybe 30 million people have been lifted out of poverty. On the other hand, 10 times that number have been lifted out of poverty in China with just simply direct foreign investment. So I'd say a lesson learned for me in trying to do good and trying to be effective with the resources we had is that perhaps the best good we can do is to create a business with real jobs and try to make a profit and grow that business and then reinvest in another business and in another business to, as, the, as, a, as an effective way, a cost effective way to impact poverty. So our, our, in our foundation, that's, that is the uh, kind of the slogan and the, the watchword is that we, through enterprise, we want to alleviate poverty. And that's, that's so we've started a coconut oil factory and we started a, uh, a small housing project, but within every, in every aim, we've started a tree farm of eucalyptus trees. In every project, we're trying to make a buck, not for ourselves, there'll never be, a, we'll never take a, a, a buck out of Africa, but we think that's the most cost-effective way. Basically, it's entrepreneurship. It's, it's starting a business and uh, creating jobs that are, well, that are good paying, in our, our philosophy at U.S. Synthetic has basically been, when you start a business, 
you really have three stakeholders. You got the employees, you've got capital or the, the people that are loaning you the money or the bank or the stockholder, and you've got the customer. In, in our way of design, in saying, well, what are we really about? What's our purpose for being? Why does U.S. Synthetic exist? Our decision was that it was for the employees. I know that when we started U.S. Synthetic, for me, it was for me. I, was a, I, was a, I had a little wife and some kids, and we, were, we had to uh, make a living. And I graduated from school, and I wanted, I could go out and take a job, but I decided to roll the dice and uh, start. I, I, had, I had bought, I had borrowed 10000 from granddad, my father's father, bought a fourplex, sold the fourplex, had 50000 That was my capital when I borrowed some, I got some other people to invest, and we started U.S. Synthetic. But when I think about the motivation, the motivation was I wanted to have a job in this valley that I could grow in and enjoy. And then I thought, as we tried to, as we realized, that we, and for 13 years, we barely survived. It was a struggle, and, uh, but we, we did somehow. We, we, we made it okay. Now there are about 900 employees. But the reason I bring up the topic is that it, in the motivation and the, say what drives us to go to work every day and what's the purpose for U.S. synthetic being. Originally, I wanted to provide a job for my wife and my kids. I mean, a job of income for the family and, and an enjoyable place to work. But my interests really were no more important than the, the employees that were coming to work there. That was their interest. They wanted to have fun. They wanted to grow in their job. They wanted to uh, be well compensated. And so we say the purpose for a company is for the employees. And that was, our, that was our marching orders. You know, in the, in the business world right now, we've seen from the 50s to today, the chief executives' wage go from 20 to 1 to 400 to 1. And, a, and, and kind of the scale is tipped to favor some champion fat cats. Not really champions, but they had the power and they can cut their own salaries. We made a determination at U.S. Synthetic that we wanted to spread the wealth, and share and let everyone benefit. And that's, that is a, makes me feel good. It makes me feel, it makes me enjoy going to work every day, or it did go to work every day. And so it was a philosophy that we would cap that, that ratio of the chief's job to the entry factory worker and not let that. And so we kept it at about 10 to one. And that's, that was a, a way of, grounding ourselves and remembering for what purpose the company existed. In the end, we sold the company to a big conglomerate, but in the sale of the company, the employees still own 10% of all profits, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a fun place to work. It's a good place to work. I'm, uh, is there another principle that I'd like to share with you? Um, we have just a minute. We're going to open it up to question and answers. I think that my advice to my kids is to get as much education as they can. I'd want, you know, the same for you, that, they, that you get as much education as you can. It's, the, it's, your, it's your meal ticket going forward. It gives you more capacity. I'd go as far as I could in my education. I'd be a problem solver and look out on some of these social issues and say, I could probably make a difference. I don't know how many of you have been in a third world country, but if you go there, if you go out, it transforms you because you see with your own eyes, your brothers and sisters on the other side of the world living in dire circumstances. And you say, I know I could help solve some of these problems. So I make a recommendation that you do take that opportunity, take an internship overseas and head not for Europe for some of the prosperous countries, but go for some of those, un, those backward countries and, and it will rewire you, to, it, because you because you're human and you got a heart, you'll see the good that you can do. I like a quote of, and I'll finish with this, it was Anne Frank, she said, isn't it wonderful that anyone can immediately begin to make the world a better place? Pretty remarkable thing for a 14 year old to to philosophize, but it's true. Everybody in this life makes the world better or worse, and, and, we, and it's a matter of choice and, and direction, and we have that capacity that, that we can 
make the world a better place. We can be a problem solver. We can use our skills, not just our literate skills, but our number skills to being problem solvers and do it in a, in a thoughtful and creative way. I'll open it up for questions, anything you'd like to discuss and talk about. Yes. So microcredit, basically the philosophy is you, uh, you enable a lady to have financial services or a man, it's mostly ladies. They will, they'll, they'll save with your bank maybe for a month or so. And once they've established their credit, that they, are, that they look like they're here to stay, then they'll apply for a loan. The loans may be $100, $200, they're generally pretty low, and they pay that out over a period of a year, and there's an interest rate that's about 20%. I mean, it's a pretty high interest rate, but that's what it takes to make a bank viable and to pay for the bank workers. So we've got about 75 full-time workers over there that are going out to the ladies. They're meeting with, our, our bank workers work with about 500 ladies. They meet in groups of 30. They do all the transactions for the day twice a month. They'll take in their savings. They'll take their loan payments. They'll record in their passbook all the transactions. They'll go back on, and record this for the bank's records. And, and the remarkable thing is that the poor are very worthy of credit. They, they, pay, they tend to pay back at about, our, our payback's about 97%. The 3% that don't pay back, chances are they died or had some calamity. They had a good reason that they didn't. So it's a, it, they're really carrying themselves. We're just making access, we're making banking services available to them in the microcredit. You know, one thing, one thing you can do as a student, write this down, K-I-V-A, kiva.org. Kiva.org just was formed by some young kids like yourselves four years ago. They've raised $200 million. And what they'll do is they'll take your loan. You'll get online and you'll say, find, if you're going to find a lady, find one of our African ladies. Our, it's called Yehu, microfinance, Y-E-H-U in Kenya. So go to Kenya, go to Yehu, and make a $25 loan to a particular lady. You'll see her face, you'll see her business described. You make a loan to her, she may be borrowing $400, but you are one of the 20, you know, and it might take 16 kids to accumulate that 400, but then you can track that lady. Did she pay the loan back? You'll lose your money if she does. I mean, it's, it's not a fake system. It really, if she loses, you lose. But you'll have that $25 and paid back within six months or so. And then you will, they'll ask you, do you want to loan it again to another lady? And so that's kind of a fun thing for poor students to do is, is to put in $25. I think you can even put in less, but it might be a, a place to start and uh, make a loan. And, uh, that's one way. You know, I guess you can always go out and start a microcredit and go live in Mozambique and uh, borrow some money from friends and families, that kind of, that's kind of what we did. Right now the bank's so big that friends and families don't help much for me because we have to borrow about a million and a half a year to grow the bank. When I could raise 100,000 or 200,000 from friends and supporters, but I can't raise a million and a half. So now the bank, Yahoo Bank is borrowing money from other commercial outfits. And Kiva, Kiva puts in 100,000 a month and we pay back about 60,000 a month. So it's, that's really a, dynamite program. And it's interest free for our lady. Our, no, our ladies are paid 20%, but for the bank, it's, it's a big shot in the arm. It lowers our overall cost of money dramatically. Anything else? Go ahead. Kiva makes their money on donations. They, uh, people just flat out donate to Kiva and, and, some, and they get some uh, institutional donations too. What are the fees for? It, I don't know. I'm not really sure of that transaction fee. That's a fee that's charged to you when you put in $25? So like, yeah, like what you can do is like oh. you get a, it's like $250. Bucks. Yeah. And you get a pick, like, you know, you get a pick of who you want to go to, you get a little story. Uh huh. Yeah. We came back that they charged us seven fifty. If we came back on Wednesday, they charged us another seven fifty to submit the rest of it. Like so they charge uh, you if you 
Okay, I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't aware of that. So I guess that's their, it's that, that's their method of surviving, I guess, and keeping Kiva alive. But you're, so you're saying your number shrinks, your, your, your investment is shrinking in the Kiva proposition. Yeah, unless you can well, do it all at one transaction. You can always just make the donation straight to you. <laughs> but then it's really gone. <laughs> but we'll keep it rolling in the organization. Anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's your credit card. If you were using a credit card, huh? Yeah, if you're paying, like, if you're using that money to send it to credit card, they have fees that they have to pay to the company to take that fee from your card. And if you, if you use PayPal, would it be less? Um, or, what, I mean, how do you get away from that? Yes. So being a number-based person, you said you just kind of Kenya is where you started, correct? Yeah. Did you just kind of point to a map and say Kenya or? No, I actually, we went, to, we went to Mexico first, had a good experience, and uh, then we took another trip with Choice Humanitarian. It's kind of an outfit out of Salt Lake that's world, I mean, that sends people out to the outermost parts where you can have a village experience for a week. So we just kind of had the experience of sitting in, and working a little bit in the village, and that's when we decided, let's stick around. What number of research, if any, did you do behind the scenes? Or did you just say, I like Kenya, I had a good experience? And yeah, no, yeah, it was just, that's because that's where Choice was going. That's the only African country that, that Choice was visiting. And so it's, uh, you know, when you, when you say, what can you do? I, when, one of the things that Mother Teresa said is the poor really don't want a gift. They want to be treated just like a human. They want to be treated like a human being. And I think so do we all. We want to be treated like human beings. And one, another thing Mother Teresa said is smile. It's a kindness to everyone you meet. It's a gift to everyone you meet. It shows your love and concern for that other individual. It recognizes the individual. That's what she would do if she were the poorest individual. That's what you and I can do. Start practicing now that we smile. And smile at each and you're, I'm talking to my grandkids now. Learn to smile. Smile at each other. Smile at your parents. Smile and and treat each other with respect and kindness, and it uh, it always comes back to you. I think one thing, uh, another thing that uh, Anne Frank said. She said, "You'll never go poor by giving things away." She was a really little remarkable philosopher, but I think that's true. You won't be poor because you set put in. 250 into Kiva, you'll, you'll be richer. Hey, thanks for having me.